I want you to mentally go back in time with me. The foundation of karate, like any other military art, was born of necessity. It was a style that was practiced with the strictest of measures, reminding one that your life was always on the line with every encounter. Your opponent might be some drunk, or it might be an invading force. With no weapons at your disposal, you needed to turn your body into a weapon. The essence of these techniques were passed down via kata, a sequence of movements that, with analysis and application, will help you learn of their techniques. Much like how the ancient Greeks invented gymnastics to keep their military strong during these times of peace, tournaments were created as another means of training to help keep some of these people's skills sharp. But at the end of the day, karate was an art for perfecting the human body to use for the act of killing. And from this never-ending cycle of self-improvement to become as dangerous a weapon as you can possibly become, we eventually got this. How did this happen? The Japanese and Okinawans have always been very serious people who took these practices to nearly religious extremes in the dedication. To take a multifaceted, complex answer and boil it down to a YouTube video talking point, the answer is the same for modern stories. Karate, over time, got lost in its own evolution and lost its connection with its roots and forgot the original point to its evolution. Again, while keeping in mind that this is a deep subject, with many different paths that all have different points here and there, with the knowledge that I'm boiling down a topic I have a deep passion for in my real life to a simplified allegory, let me explain. Karate had a simple philosophy. One strike, one kill. Amass enough power so that a single strike of yours was enough to kill your opponent. Sparring and tournaments went hand in hand. You did tournaments with the knowledge that its goal was to test out some of your skills for the purposes of life or death combat in a controlled setting where you wouldn't actually die or get maimed. Over time, heading into the 20th century, the need for that power to kill was not needed as much in the literal sense, so it began to be needed in the metaphysical sense, with one strike one kill being more of a philosophy, an idea, instead of a goal. The strict, authoritarian training of these warriors lessened. Tournaments, instead of being a mere means of training, became a fun time end in and of themselves. The tournaments had specific rules that of course had to be applied to avoid injury, and also had in it the idea that people would be training to fight and kill, not for the tournament itself. In a karate competition, the idea behind one strike one kill was shown in Ippon, one point for a successful strike on your opponent. What didn't matter, however, was the power in that strike. So with the philosophy of one strike one kill going from physical goal to metaphysical idea, you did not need to train for power. As such, tournament fighters trained more for speed, quickness and swiftness. Get in, score a point, get out. Bring home trophy. The life and death battles were no more. Jimmy from Ohio did not have to worry about Mongolian marauders invading his island. While there is something to be said about certain things being stuck in their own ways and refusing to evolve, the problem of things evolving beyond the original point until they become something completely unrecognizable is a common one indeed. I could write volumes of the script on this point alone, but it was an analogy to better showcase why your mother's stories are such piles of meaningless garbage. They've lost their original purpose, their very soul, evolved into an ugly husk that is as much a story as a band-aid with your hairs and blood attached to it is a person. As I talked about it in more depth in my other video, you are a story. Our minds, especially as children, don't actually do a good job differentiating fantasy from reality. And in, anyways, I want to tell you about the world of The Lion King. Now, one of the things I want you to notice is that when you go see that movie, or when you show it to your kids, when you watch it at home, I don't care what, you fall into it. And that's very strange because, first of all, it's not a world, it's drawings, right? It's animated drawings of a world, it's very low resolution. And the creatures aren't human, they're animals, you've all noticed that, no doubt. And the world is magical because things happen in it that aren't 
the sorts of things that obviously happen in the real world. But you don't care about any of that. You don't care that the animals talk. You don't care that the lions are kings. All of that makes perfect sense to you. And that means that, which is a very strange thing, which it means that the manner in which the characters are represented and the world that they inhabit is somehow familiar to you. Because otherwise you wouldn't fall into it and you wouldn't even, and you'd notice that what you're doing is so strange because it really is so strange. These stories we are told as children and throughout our entire lives serve as fundamental building blocks to who we really are. The Boy Who Cried Wolf was not a story about wolves. It was a story about betraying people's trust, told in an allegory. That was its core meaning, its essence, its soul. If a modern-day blue-haired writer were to set out to make a movie on the story, they would not be looking for nuances on the idea of trust. They would not try to expand the mindset of the boy, why he may have did this, to give the modern-day viewer some kind of personal, though not literal, connection, so they could, on the metaphysical level, connect with the boy. Oh, we didn't set out to make all these unpopular changes that ultimately ruined the product you see, but the world has changed now and we had to update it for modern audiences. Because ultimately, the people they're really catering to are themselves. It's an excuse for them to indulge their own narcissism, to impose their own worldview, to undo the things that they don't like and replace it with stuff they personally want to see. It's not about respecting and building on what came before, it's about sweeping it all away and consigning it to the ash heap of history, replacing it with their ideas, their ideology, their view of how the world should be. They would not give the person the opportunity to see themselves in their shoes, maybe the consequences of easily giving into boredom, or perhaps showcasing that the boy has himself experienced some form of trust erosion, and so he cannot take the concept of re-establishing trust with anyone seriously, using that to dive into another fundamental concept of not becoming the monster that you hate. See, great stories are patterns of adaptive behavior. They're, they're representations of patterns of adaptive behavior. And they work at multiple levels of, that's called, pol, 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 I don't know how to pronounce it. I've only read it. Polysemy, P-O-L-Y-S-E-M-Y. -E the fact that a great story is true at multiple levels of analysis simultaneously. And you see this even in, even in popular culture. Like if you, if you watch a, a show like The Simpsons, an animated show, kids can watch it. But there's content for adults. You can interpret it at different levels of analysis. And truly great stories can be interpreted at multiple levels of analysis simultaneously. That's actually what gives them depth. So when you say a story is deep, well, here's a meaning. Oh, look, here's another. Oh, look, here's another one. And then the meanings often exist in parallel with one another. And great stories, and the really archetypal stories are like that. The story of Moses, for example, that's, that's an archetypal story. The idea that people escape from tyranny go through a crisis, spend time wandering in the desert, are moving towards a better place. It's like, that's the story of life. No. If it was made in modern day, the focus would be on how cool looking the CGI of the wolf will be. It will be on how detailed and graphic the final attack on the boy will turn out. They'll make the boy some snobby little shit with all the one-liners and sarcastic quips that today's youth can totally relate to that somehow still applies to medieval Europe they'll throw in a pointless love interest, while adding in the twist that one of the townsfolk is gay, so we have a love triangle. The boy will now become a symbol of the patriarchy, and the wolf will be the good guy because she was tearing down the societal norms of telling inappropriate jokes, and the boy will be named Donald. The stories of our past, at least the ones that didn't have the intention of giving us some good laughs, were ones that resonated with our souls in some way or another that let people internally tackle with metaphysical problems and allow them to better combat them when confronted with them. And people are very interested in such bits of information, such units of information, because we need to know how to conduct ourselves in complex environments. And so if someone's willing to share their experience and they can narrate it in an interesting story, we're absolutely more than happy to listen. Because in some sense, we're assembling our identities out of those stories. And then you can think that there are patterns across stories, which is really a useful thing to understand because what, that gives you real insight into what constitutes an archetype because an archetype is what's common across sets of stories. That might be one way of looking at it. So an archetype is like a meta story. Be presented in fiction with the devastation of unbearable loneliness and the pain of loss. And you may want to think twice over throwing your marriage away over some petty squabble. 
Hear the tales of the clashes of gods in their ceaseless, never-ending struggles, or the stories of a brave warrior from a land far away to inspire you to achieve greater heights for yourself. These concepts are vital for our personal growths from childhood to adulthood, and from adulthood to our ideal selves. If you have a child who's going around admiring Superman, it'll be your job as a parent, assuming you're an adult and not someone still trapped in adolescence, to help foster that growth of being such a grand ideal, while making sure he doesn't try to jump off rooftops to fly or stop trains with his hand. And this process of learning continues throughout our adult lives, but at that point, the stories need to be tempered by your own wills and wisdom. It's really not much different from, say, reading a non-fiction book. There's a book I read ages ago called On Killing, The Psychological Cost of Learning to Kill in War and Society. It did a fantastic job outlining to me on a logical, intellectual basis the consequences of war and murder on the minds of people who pull the trigger, be it proverbial or literal. It highlighted many interesting facets, such as how people are more likely to kill in a civil war than a national war. These more down-to-earth, intellectually driven books helped me a lot in my perception of combat and war. You know what else did as well? The recent remake, All is Quiet on the Western Front. This scene specifically, I found to be haunting, and it hit all of my emotional, empathetic bases of the horrors of war. For the sake of not being taken down to, to excessive violence or copyright, I'm mostly just going to use still images from the scene. Stuck in a disgusting mud hole, the men struggle and fight. Our main character grabs his knife and plunges it several times into the enemy soldier. He backs off. Unfortunately, the man is still alive. He gargles blood, struggling to breathe. The main character, haunted by the noises, grabs some mud and shoves it down the dying man's throat to shut him up. He is still alive. After some time, the main character walks over, grabs some cloth, and puts it in the filthy water, attempting to give the man something to drink as he cleans him off. He attempts to apply pressure to the punctured wounds. He now wishes to save this man's life, a man who is also trying to kill him. But his attempts fail, and the gargling sound finally stops, leaving the man with his lifeless blue eyes, to haunt both the main character and us. This was work of fiction. The two men were actors, playing out a script. The wounds were not real. The man didn't actually die. The main character did not actually break down in tears. Does any of that really matter? Was there no emotion running through your body during this time? Was there no sense of empathy for either the dying man or the teenager who tried to kill him, then tried to save him, all for nothing? All is quiet on the Western Front was originally a book written by a World War I veteran trying to shed some light on what he witnessed and experienced during that war. Was his tale between these two men real or fictional? Did art imitate life, or did life give birth to art? It's a question I no longer care about the answer to, because it doesn't matter. The man's story, whether born from a literal experience or an alchemical mashup of many horrific events, giving birth to a single scene meant to capture them, came from him and his experiences. The writers of today, they don't have any experiences or events that they can pull from. It's the shallow, arrogant, self-absorbed mentality of people that have been coddled and praised their entire lives, that have never struggled, never experienced hardship or danger, never ventured outside their own carefully controlled echo chamber. The kind of people who see the past as an enemy to be defeated instead of a rich tapestry of ideas and experiences they can learn from. They haven't gone through the aforementioned process of internal alchemy, taking a multitude of different concepts, ideas, or events, and molding them into something brand new, an original work of art. To try and more clearly analogize this, they don't even understand the concepts of taking a mother and a father, uniting their love, and having these two distinct beings create a third, separate and unique from the two of them, while still containing both of their DNA. Instead, what these writers do in this analogy is they either chop off some of their limbs or grab body parts of various corpses after a night of grave robbing, put them together with some scotch tape, and then proclaim, huzzah, I have created life. That's why everything seems to need to be some sort of reboot or remake. Why everything just feels like a soulless copy and paste. They are no longer creating. They are throwing together corpses and hoping you will not be able to tell the difference. That's the nutshell analogy right there. They are not a man and a woman giving birth to a new life. They are a zerd and a frog self going grave robbing, glooming together decaying limbs, 
and trying to convince you that if you don't think that Cope's baby isn't as valid as a living baby, then you hate the Jews. I want to end this by outlining a segment in one of my stories that still only exists behind the scenes. It is a story that I have worked on and developed in my mind and on paper for over 15 years now. You won't need specific names, I'll just give the premise before the segments. In the story, we'll call it an anime because that's what I initially set out to make. After World War II, the world got together and decided to do away with firearms, missiles, and all matter of modern warfare. This didn't make anything more peaceful, but it allowed the martial arts to flourish. And now the entire world is enveloped in martial arts on a level that other societies enveloped with the internet. You cannot separate the two. This shouldn't have to be said, but an obligatory message about how this is not a modern day commentary on guns or warfare. All I was seeking out to do was create a world where hand to hand combat and martial arts was the main combat force. That's it. After high school, the students can either go off to a regular college, or they can go to a special dojo, referred to as a dojo school, to distinguish it from a traditional dojo, to continue their pursuit in the martial arts. Whether it be to go to the military, become a sensei, a medical professional dealing with combat trauma, whatever it may be. If any of this sounds familiar, the idea of a martial arts focused school came from the anime Tenjo Tenge, but I took it and twisted it into my own little thing. The particular dojo school that the story will focus on has quite the reputation problem. It has become the place where the worst people go to hone their skills and become the dregs of society. The teachers and administrators can only do so much to quell this. The place is overrun with rival gangs, all with their own niche of how they do things. At the head of all these is our main antagonist, the strongest out of anyone around and head of the gang most feared. Few dare to challenge his power, except of course for our main protagonist, whose whole persona can be called the manifestation of unbridled ambition, in a ceaseless sense of righteousness, who seeks to clean up the dojo school before he graduates and moves on, for personal reasons that are not important right now. He frequently challenges the main antagonist, outclassed as he might be. Our protagonist eventually builds up something of an entourage of his own, threatening the power structure and balance between all the gangs. To sum up a series of events, this makes our antagonist start to lose it, and so he decides, in his own fit of rage, to send a message to this new group threatening him. He chooses one of the side characters. She's a lovely young girl, who truth be told, never wanted to get caught up in any of this. Her goal is not to be a fighter, her goal is to be a healer. While she abhors fighting in combat, she finds a deep sense of beauty in the pursuit of self-perfection martial arts brings out of people. So while she wishes to study these people on a deep, metaphysical level, she also wishes to do whatever she can to ensure that their careers are never cut short due to injury. She is not one who in any way challenges the power structure, but that does not protect her from the main antagonist, who is, to put it mildly, not a nice person. He finds her one night, leaving the dojo. He surrounds her with his gang. She's not a fighter, but he doesn't care. He begins viciously, mercilessly, brutally beating her. In the show, you will get flashes of her bones breaking, blood splattering on the ground, her drifting in and out of consciousness. As a final act of cruelty, the antagonist grabs her by the hair and drags her to a brick wall. He pushes the side of her face as hard as he can against it and starts dragging her head across the coarse, jagged bricks. She is screaming, flailing, all to no avail. A trail of blood and skin showcase her path. Even the other gang members are disgusted by this act, but they are too afraid to speak up. Eventually, the rest of the protagonists hear about this and find out everything that happened. She was to serve as a warning to them after all. She needed facial reconstruction surgery. She only has so much money, and the skill to bring her back to normal does not currently exist in the Japanese medical field. Now she'll be left with scars and disfigurement that will never go away on their own. The event has tainted her very soul, and that purity that was once there begins to blacken. The group decides in unison, with no word spoken, what they will do about this. The episode in which the next events will take place will be called Justice. They find a time in which they are able to catch the antagonist by himself at night, just like he did to her. He offers to challenge any of them, much like these martial duels so often happen, but they are not here for the challenge, they are here for revenge. They systematically beat down the antagonist, just like he did to her. They don't use any martial arts to do it, they just use brutality. Some use baseball bats, one even has a sword, which he uses to stab the lower legs of the antagonist. The main character, and some of the more prominent characters, then take turns, snapping one elbow, then another, then his knee, then the other. Finally, he falls unconscious. What they have done to him, they're not shallow injuries. 
his life as a fighter is over, at least as far as they know. On the next episode, each of the characters who took part, and some who chose not to, start lamenting over what they had done. They became beasts, hampered by being unable to turn to authorities. They decided to take justice into their own hands, but is that what they did? Was the brutality really one of civilized people? Is this what his victim, the one who dedicated her life to healing people so they can keep fighting, would have wanted? To have another's career ended by a brutal, bloodthirsty mob? That's why this episode's title is, as a mirror to the previous one, Justice? Now the Beatty's personalities argue amongst themselves if their actions were righteous or not. If becoming like the enemy they seek to destroy can really be considered a win. Some argue that a single act of retribution is not enough to taint who they are as martial artists. Others argue that what they have done has kicked open a door that they will not be able to close. Some feel their honor as a warrior is now forever tainted, while others question what is the point of their honor anymore if having it just leads to what happened to their friend. If they didn't do what they did, what else would have stopped the antagonist from doing something like that again? All their previous methods to stop him using honorable ways has only led to the antagonist constantly finding this honorable means to fuck with them. And it has all accumulated to this point. This group that set out to do good, to put a stop to the gangs who were corrupting the dojo, are they now just becoming another gang, vying for power? This question becomes more important a couple of arcs later, when we start to get a glimpse of the origin stories of the other gangs now roaming the school. Within this story are elements that did not exist in 2006 when I began to work on it. That's because my own experiences in life have molded what other internally moving fictional stories, as well as real life personal events, and has created, shaped, and molded this narrative through the years. Whether it's using the very weapon and tactics of the enemy, or questioning just how far you will take your concept of honor, whether the road you are paving with good intentions will lead to salvation or hell, these are problems and questions that have plagued mankind and led us to question these concepts and ourselves for as long as we've been able to utter sounds from our mouth. And the reason these stories and narratives are constantly retold is because they don't have a singular answer. Tell me in the comments, what do you think the outcome will be of the action the characters took against the antagonist? The main character, with his ambition that seems to burn everything around him, who seeks to clean up the school but has now turned to their methods, or the man who seeks to achieve the pinnacle of human perfection, to earn the title of greatest warrior unrivaled under the heavens, or the man who bases his entire life on the warrior's code, who holds on to the old ways of fighting before World War II changed everything, who sees all of this training as a means to an end, or the man who is already viewed by many as a worthless street punk, trying to turn his own reputation around despite everyone going against him, who also loved the victim, the former beacon of innocence and faith who was assaulted. That's not even all the characters who took part, let alone those who chose not to. Do you know from this information what the future of the group will be? What their relationships will become? Who will try and justify this? Who will question everything they've done up until now because of this? Peeling back to surface, what this scene can be boiled down to is, after you have committed grave atrocities in the name of good, what is the proper reaction? Where do you go after you've crossed that line? Do you take a step back? Can you take a step back? What is right and what is wrong? Every character, every persona, will have some element that the audience can relate to, and they will be able to see how those archetypes will handle such an action born from blinding hatred and rage, and they will be able to see the outcome of those archetypes' choices. They are free to decide from there whether or not they agree with the choices, or even my decision of where those choices will lead. This isn't the only major piece of work I have in the background. I have two other behind the scenes works that I have never really spoken about. And on the surface, a much more lighthearted webcomic that's upcoming, as well as the project Let's Make an Anime About Ninja. Yes, I know it's been like 3 years since I pitched the idea, but I relaunched it last month, give me a break. So if you want to support not only videos like this, but for one day these stories that I have to finally come to life, consider heading over to my website, The Dragon's Treasure. The best support is The Dragon's Wings program, but if you do not want to just give money for nothing, the website is also for my online business, the anime themed tea store. Buy yourself a cup of tea. Just know that unlike other YouTuber promotions and sponsors, I'm not pitching somebody else's products with no idea of their quality, wishing only to get paid. These are my products, and they speak directly to me. Oh yes, hit the like button, share, subscribe, and don't forget to give me your comments down below. 